sorry, I'm Phil Morgan, and um, I think my role is to uh, essentially make sure people um, uh, keep to the time. That's what I've been told. This is a session on slavery and law in uh, New England. I'm going to introduce um, the uh, presenters in the order that they will appear, and then, uh, and then I'll just sit back and make sure that they um, keep to their time limit. Um, so the first presenter will be James Allegro, who got his PhD from Johns Hopkins, uh, awarded last year. His dissertation is entitled Legislative Difference, Race, Law, and the Codification of Northern Provincial Society, 1620 to 1765. He's published an article that I'm sure some of you have read in um, the New England Quarterly uh, in 2002, and he's presently um, a visiting assistant professor at Case Western Reserve University. And his paper today is the idea of New England slavery, slave law, self-government, and the glorious revolution in Massachusetts, New York, and Maryland. Um, our second presenter will be uh, Paul Finkerman. He's the Chapman Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Tulsa College of Law. He was awarded his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1976. He's the author of many books and articles, far too numerous uh, to mention here, uh, many of them dealing with slavery and the law, so he's extremely well qualified for this panel. And he will speak on ending slavery in New England, the interaction of law and social forces. And our last presenter is uh, Emily Blank. Um, she was awarded her PhD from Emory University in 2003. Her dissertation is entitled Revolution Revolutionizing Slavery, the Legal Culture of Slavery in Revolutionary Massachusetts and South Carolina, 1765 to 1789. Uh, and like Jim Allegro, she has an article um, on 1783, The Turning Point in the Law of Slavery, also in the New England Quarterly in 2002. And she's presently at, at um, uh, Rowan, <coughs> is it Rowan? Rowan. Rowan University. And her paper today is The Legal Emancipation of Leander and Caesar, Manumission and the Law in Revolutionary South Carolina and Massachusetts. And then finally, we have, and it's my great privilege to, uh, because I've, I've uh, watched her perform in, uh, in, uh, in previous conferences, and she's always dynamite, um, Annette Gordon-Reed, professor of law at New York University Law School. She, uh, she actually is a historian by training, but then left history and uh, uh, received her JD from Harvard in 1984. She's, I'm sure, extremely well known to you all for her 1997 book, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, which then um, she, uh, she, she then was able to update her introduction and prove, uh, prove that she was really prescient when the DNA uh, proved her correct. Um, she's recently co-authored a book uh, with Vernon Jordan, a civil rights leader, and her most recent book is Race on Trial, Law and Justice in American History. And she's presently writing, um, and we'll all await, I'm sure, with great anticipation, a book on the Hemings family. So it's my, it's a great privilege to uh, present uh, Annette to you as the commentator on the three papers. So I'll just turn it over now to them, um, and I'll just go in order one after the other. Thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction, Sison. Uh, it, it seems to me from our discussions last night, as well as from the press for this conference, that uh, historians of New England have a, a special and particular mission, overcoming the collective amnesia of bondage that pervades this region, and in turn placing New England slavery alongside the seemingly more vital and important melodrama. Can you hear me? Sorry. Thank you. I'll get closer. Uh, collective amnesia of bondage that pervades this region and in turn places New England slavery alongside the seemingly more vital and important melodrama that was the master-slave nexus in the South. Uh, I could be wrong, but it seems our collective impulse is to assert the importance and vitality of bondage to the region as a way of overcoming this amnesia, to uh, assert the particularity of New England slavery, as we were talking about last night. <laughs> But it occurred to me in the context of coming up with something for this, this panel that perhaps there might be another way. Perhaps we could get rid of the idea of New England altogether. The idea of a Chesapeake slavery, the idea of a mid-Atlantic slavery, the idea of a southern or northern slavery for that matter. Um, this paper will take a small and modest step toward moving the locus of slavery studies off of the region and onto the province. I'm going to do this today through an institutional narrative that in limited ways and at least through the lens of session law. 
asserts that Massachusetts Bay Colony had something in common with two colonies not so much associated with New England, Maryland and New York, and in some small ways, it may have even had more in common with these colonies than Rhode Island, Connecticut, or New Hampshire. Uh, I think we need to remember that when discussing the law, the law of slavery or any other kind of law, that there was no such entity as New England law, much less Northern law or Southern law. And as such, the institutional context of bondage in so-called regions like New England would wind up differing greatly from province to province. A broad array of political concerns influenced the provincial development of slavery, including the age, the size, and wealth of particular provinces, the relationship between assemblies and governors, relations between competing interest groups within the assembly, uh, settlers' diverse interests and imperatives, and the intricacies of the colonial charters. A number of other external conditions would further influence political, racial, political and racial policy, including warfare, relations with Native American polities, the creation of new provinces, and perhaps most interestingly, metropolitan attitudes toward colonial self-determination. The nexus of metropolitan policy, law, self-determination were especially critical factors in the codification of racial law in Massachusetts, particularly as they informed the types of laws passed by provincial legislators. Broadly speaking, racial laws in British America can be divided into five broad categories laws penalizing behaviors, non-criminal and criminal, statutes regulating people of color's access to civic practices and institutions, provisions regulating access to guns, acts defining or restricting the institution of bondage itself, and acts establishing law enforcement mechanisms for regulating the prosecution of slaves. Now compared to the rest of the region, Massachusetts Bay legislators between 1680 and 1720 passed significantly fewer acts devoted to regulating criminal behavior than all of the other New England colonies. Substantially more acts dealing with slaves' access to civic practices and institutions. Massachusetts passed 40% fewer laws singling people of color out for crimes of theft, murder, arson, fornication, theft, running away, or violating curfew. Half that more, 15% more laws defining access to civic institutions like the franchise, naturalization, jury trials, marriage, access to public burials, public gatherings, and manumission. And 19% more laws barring or limiting slaves' access to the militia or preventing them from owning guns. The question becomes why this emphasis on civic institutions and firearms? And part of the answer is related to the political and military context of the late 17th century. Charles II and James II, um, as we all know, attempting to extend greater control over their North American possessions, commanded their colonial representatives to pursue a strict policy of political and commercial centralization. In Massachusetts, royal officials would eradicate the colonial charter in 19... Um, 1684, and subsumed the province under a centralized political authority known as the Dominion of New England. The governor of, Dominion, of the Dominion between 1686 and 1689 would systematically undermine colonial liberties, such as the right to jury trial, suspending habeas corpus, limiting travel outside the colony, and so on. But perhaps the worst offense would occur on October 4th, 1687 when royal officials would bring several men from Ipswich before a special court for refusing to pay a recently enacted royal tax. The colonists claimed that they would refuse to pay the tax because it was an illegal infringement of their right to self-representation. The court would disagree, and one justice would tell the offenders that they, quote, must not think the laws of England would follow them to ye ends of ye earth. The only liberty they possessed, one justice contended, was a negative one. The court would find all six men guilty uh, and declare that they, quote, had no more privileges than not to be sold for slaves. The governor of the province would support the decision, the high-handed comment, but he would go one step further, querying the offenders, mocking them by way of ridicule, 
whether they thought, quote, Jack and Tom might tell the king what monies he must have for the use of the government. Those who heard the comment believed that Andros was implying that the people of the country were but a cull of ignorant Jacks and Toms, and that he and his crew had ye immediate dispose of their fortunes. Settlers' claims to free English freeborn privilege were thus akin to simple-minded assertions of Jacks and Toms. I'm thinking African slaves. The colonists would not forget the comparison. April 1689, in the wake of rumors that William of Orange would overthrow, had overthrown the Stuart dynasty, the colonial militia would march on Boston and undertake a successful coup against Andros and his supporters. The rebels would celebrate William III for rescuing the province from, quote, the brinks of slavery and popery. They would further explain that the revolt had been necessary to save the province from those who they believed uh, from those who believed that the king's subjects in New England did not differ much from slaves, and that the only difference was that they were not bought and sold. It would destroy our father's peaceful graves, saw their poor posterity made slaves, wrote the author of an anonymous broadside uh, from 1689. I'm sorry, the anonymous author of a broadside entitled The Plain Case Stated. The decision would remain on the minds of people and pervade political discourse for at least another two decades. In 1707, while the assembly remained locked in a struggle with the governor over the prosecution of Queen Anne's war, settlers again would invoke the incident as a benchmark of autocratic government. One tract compared the governor's policies to that crew of mercenary fellows who had once proclaimed that New Englanders were all slaves. And as such, they must not think that the privileges of Englishmen follow them to the ends of the world. 1687 court case, its language and implications would pervade, influence, and reflect political policymaking in the 1690s. As local officials commissioned to pick up the pieces of the glorious revolution would turn to the law to secure their personal privileges. Massachusetts receives a new charter in 1691 and then goes about passing numerous laws recodifying, or in some instances for the first time, codifying English rights of self-government, including an act setting forth general privileges and an act establishing habeas corpus. These laws would codify, many freedoms that, codify freedoms that many felt had been confiscated during the 1680s, including bail, legislative consent, and due process. There were a laundry list of, of rights, practically. Um, with these laws, another series of laws would meanwhile protect the colonial frontier from the threat of French and Native American invasion. A haphazard, poorly coordinated, and possibly pro-French Catholic frontier policy would number among the many charges launched against Stuart government during the spring and summer of 1689. The flower of our youth stood in jeopardy, complained one author, because Andros had subjected an inexperienced militia to the tedious fatigues of a long and cold winter. Many scores of miles to the northward, fears of long winter marches would become reality once diplomatic relations between France and England break down, uh, and inaugurating a, a century worth of conflict in King William's War, Queen Anne's War, and so on. In response to the threat of invasion, the assembly would enact, again, a series of laws, tightening requirements for militia service, revising the chain of command, punishing deserters, and appropriating funds for the construction of new forts. They would also bar people of color from militia service. The 1693 law, an act for regulating the militia, would bar Native Americans and Africans from African, persons of African descent from participation in the public defense. This is not the first time this law passes in Massachusetts. It passes for the first time in the 1650s, but the 1693 statute would reflect the concerns of a new generation of legislators struggling with the specter of French invasion. The author of a 1706 editorial from the Boston Newsletter would complain, Negroes do not carry arms to defend the country, and if necessity call for it, then the husbandman must fit out a man against the enemy. If he has a Negro, he cannot find him. Because of the law, because of this perceived uh, lack of capacity on the part of persons of African def des def uh, descent to defend the colony, slaves were deemed unreliable servants in the public defense. 
In addition to laws prohibiting slaves access to guns, colonists also passed laws restricting people of color's civic status. In the broadest sense, these laws were part of a, a, a cycle or a bundle of acts passed during the legislature during this time to recover from the 1680s, protect freeborn privileges, and defend the frontier. They did not explicitly deal with the question of African Americans' access to specific rights such as habeas corpus or due process. However, they did restrict slaves' ability to partake in a broad array of institutions and practices critical to participation in a free polity. These laws would make manumission a near impossibility, restrict freedom of movement, and exclude people of color from access to critical social institutions such as marriage, the ta uh, taverns, and the militia. 1693, legislators would bar tavern owners from selling liquor to, quote, Negroes and Indians. 1703, they would impose a curfew on free and enslaved people of color by empowering constables to retain any person suspected to be abroad after 9 o'clock without a pass. The law would place severe restrictions on, manu on masters attempting to manumit their slaves. And in 1705, the assembly would outlaw interracial sex and marriage. In sum, the challenges of, of this period would prompt Massachusetts Bay settlers to enact a series of laws designed to affirm political rights and stabilize the frontier. These provisions would restate freeborn privileges, as well as strengthen the night watch and redefine requirements for militia service. Accompanying these statutes were a series of discussions determining who got to partake in these rights and responsibilities. People of color would suffer a debased status as a result of these discussions, deemed by lawmakers as incapable of partaking in the polity and deemed a threat to frontier safety. Put simply, Bay colonists defended their freedoms by restricting those of their slaves. Interestingly enough, a similar pattern can be seen in two other colonies that also experienced the political and military problems of this era, Maryland and New York. The Crown incorporated New York into the Dominion of New England, but not before repealing the much celebrated and controversial Charter of Liberties, which was a like-minded statement of freeborn privileges, and ordering the governor to expand the powers of the executive and deny settlers the right to elect county officers. Maryland would, settlers would meanwhile struggle under the administration of another high-handed royal official, uh, perceived high-handed royal official, Lord Baltimore. Tensions between settlers and this proprietor would erupt on occasion before the 1680s over land sales, the franchise, and the distribution of patronage. The proprietor's final veto over all laws, as well as his assistant, insistence that the assembly only enact temporary statutes, were important factors in the eruption of violence between proprietary and anti-proprietary factions during the mid-17th century. Following in the footsteps of the Boston Re Rebels, Maryland, residents of Maryland and New York would likewise rebel against royal government in 1689. May 31st, as we all know, German militia officer Jacob Leisler would lead an attack against the governor and his supporters in New York City. Several months later, John Coode and several hundred of his Protestant associators would march on St. Mary's City and depose Baltimore's executive council. Again, like Massachusetts, participants in the uprisings would defend their actions as an attempt to rescue personal freedom from absolutist government. Maryland's grievances why they have taken up arms, for instance, depicted a colonial constituency that had suffered for too long under the injustices and tyranny of a papist government that dispensed law at will, confiscated property, and subjected people to oaths of fidelity without a nod to the crown. Leisler's followers likewise rallied against a papishly affected governor that had accepted a commission now on record that allowed him to make laws and raise taxes as the French king doth. Fears of political oppression would once again morph into real and perceived concerns of slavery in a manner not too dissimilar from the 1687 court case involving the Ipswich men in Massachusetts Residents of New York and Maryland would again invoke this connection, rhetorical and otherwise, between personal freedom, law, civic status, and slavery. Leisler's followers, for example, would use slaves as human evidence of their own political authority on May 31, 1689, when an Indian slave belonging to Philip French was dragged to the fort and there imprisoned. The rebels seized French, a prominent New York merchant and supporter of the governor, and carried him through the streets in a most humiliating manner. 
Anti-Lease Larians were up in arms about the arrest and depicted it as an assault against French's rights to private property and self-determination, complaining that arbitrary government had placed him where he should never see the face of man anymore. This all started over an Indian slave. The fact that a Native American slave proved the lightning rod for the struggle for freeborn privileges evidenced the emerging role of slavery in the unfolding controversies over civic privilege. The Lyslarians also manipulated racial metaphors to their advantage, specifically during treason trials, the treason trial of noted anti Lyslarian Nicholas Bayard. 1702, Hannah Hutchins, the wife of Bayard's confidant, and suspected co-conspirator John Hutchins would use slavery, the rhetoric of, of slavery, to defend her husband from accusations that he had conspired with Bayard to distribute libels against the crown. Recounting how Bayard had come to her house with papers for her husband, Hutchins testified that her husband never got the chance to see them because she had, quote, delivered them to a Negro who was sent for them. Hutchins then went on to say that she could not remember whose Negro it was, revealing her story to be as much political and racial strategy as an actual accounting of events. By taking pains to point out that she had relegated the task of disposing these very important papers to a person lacking in the privileges of the polity, but conveniently forgetting who that person was or who that person was linked to, it seems to me that Hutchins was connecting the colony's evolving racial and occupational order to Bayard's political motivations and character. Specter of African bondage would also enter political debates in Maryland, although in a different manner. At the height of tensions between settlers and the proprietary government, Baltimore's executive council, upon the happy news of the birth of the young prince, would pardon two African slaves condemned to death by ordering them return to their several masters. Council followed up several days later, ordering that, quote, their masters paying and discharging their just fees and the said Negroes to serve the said masters as slaves as if they had never been condemned and pardoned as aforesaid. All slaves, servants, and others residing in St. Mary City County were also ordered to abstain from bodily labor to celebrate the birth of the prince. I've had trouble reading this, but uh, at least in part, it seems as if slavery um, was in part an effort on the part of the proprietary faction to fashion royal government as the champion of private property and personal privilege. Few Maryland residents were convinced. Whoa. Does my graduating from Johns Hopkins give me any extra time? No? All right. Um, okay, well, the emergence of a rhetorical and political strategy of slavery during the 1680s paralleled a, a pragmatic series of legislative decisions regarding exactly who had those freeborn rights during the 1690s and early 1700s. These decisions would follow a trajectory similar to Massachusetts Bay, these laws, and involved codifying white freeborn privilege, excluding people of color from the militia, and then limiting slaves' access to a broad array of civic institutions and practices. Massachusetts, uh, Maryland would pass an act for naturalization and an act to secure freeborn rights. And then the same year, they would limit the privileges and rights of people of color by restricting their access to manumission, barring them from private property, and banning them from participating in trade. Um, still another law from the same session would bar slaves who had converted to Christianity from suing their masters for their freedom. A similar series of laws in the same pattern as Massachusetts and New York would occur in Maryland would occur in New York all the residents of this colony would place more emphasis on naturalization rights. In the early 1680s and then in the 1710s, legislators would enact uh, a naturalization act, several statements of freeborn privilege, uh, and then several laws barring slaves from critical freedom such as manumission, access to the franchise, and property ownership, again in the same pattern. Uh, interestingly, this post-1689 pattern linking African bondage to law, frontier stability, and personal rights would be unique to Massachusetts, Maryland, and New York. A comparison of the content of racial laws in these three provinces as compared to the other mainland provinces at the time exhibits a substantial degree of variation along regional lines. Racial laws in New York, Massachusetts, and in Maryland contained more material dealing with civic status and access to guns than the remaining provinces. 11% more material devoted to defining civic status uh, and 11% more material living slaves' access to firearms. Um, I'll make my way to conclude now. 
Um, I can talk later about uh, other parts of this. Uh, but some necessary caveats by way of conclusion. Uh, all I've tried to do today here is establish an institutional narrative. Whether or not these provincial distinctions play themselves out on the ground in courthouses, in taverns, in plantations remains to be seen and is a very important question. I suspect that in order to prove a distinctive trajectory for bondage in these three colonies, I also have to establish that the types of cases brought before different county courts in different colonies also differed in terms of timing and subject matter. In other words, the people of color appear before criminal courts in Massachusetts, Maryland, and New York more often for offenses against the civic order. Additionally, I'm painfully aware of the fact that I've yet to address the effect of this moment on the slave community itself. Did the fallout from the Glorious Revolution change the way slaves interacted with one another or with their masters? Several years after Leisler's rebellion, an African-American servant would appear before a New York court for striking the mayor of the city. Would the same incident, the timing of this incident, have occurred in colonies that had largely escaped the tumult of the era, such as Connecticut or Pennsylvania? 1693, an unnamed biracial servant petitioned the Maryland legislature for her freedom on the grounds that her master had punished her in a cruel and excessive manner. The fact that the governor's council was stocked with pro-John Coode appointees and the fact that her master was an outspoken supporter of the Baltimore regime is no coincidence. Was her petition timed so as to exploit pre-existing divisions among the colony's elite? Did slaves resist or rebel differently in provinces beset with fierce and public debates over self-government and public freedom? Um, even if the answer is no, although I suspect it might be yes, the distinctive pattern of provincial session law in Maryland, Massachusetts, and New York in the generation after 1690 suggests a, a, a need to rethink regional definitions of bondage and by extension calls into question the idea of New England slavery itself. So, did I make it? Can you all hear me? Is this working? Okay, good. Nodding hands, that's good. In thinking about the end of slavery in New England, two questions arise, the why and the how. And these are interrelated. That is, what is the ideology of why slavery ended in New England and how did it end? Why did New England, along with Pennsylvania, lead the North in ending slavery? How was this accomplished? What were the conflicting and competing ideological issues that led to these questions? What were the historical factors that led to New England's early assault on bondage? And how did these ideological factors affect the implementation of abolition in the region? First, I want to talk about the why. The simple answer to the why has often been a rather unreflexive and not very deeply thought out appeal to demography, economics, and geography. The story that we have been told for many years is that there were few slaves in New England, slavery in New England was economically unimportant, and therefore it was very easy for New Englanders to get rid of slavery and difficult for Southerners to get rid of slavery. These explanations have some validity. Surely the small number of slaves did affect abolition in New England, but they do not in fact provide full answers or complete answers. The economic for the argument for the abolition of slavery in New England and the rest of the North is inherently weak. Slavery was not unprofitable in the North or in New England. Ulrich B. Phillips' explanation for slavery in the South, what he called 90 degrees in the shade, simply cannot explain uh, the profitability of slavery in the South or the North. Uh, in Maryland, slaves like Frederick Bailey, who reinvented himself as Frederick Douglass when he escaped to Massachusetts, worked in shipyards, building and repairing boats, making sails as longshoremen and as warehousemen. Throughout the Atlantic world, slaves worked on all kinds of vessels, as the narrative of Equiano reminds us. Indeed, some New England merchants, such as John Brown of Providence, did use slaves on his ships. In the Carolinas, slaves worked in the lumber industry. Surely slaves could have worked in the shipyards of New England. They surely could have worked in this, just as they worked in the shipyards of Baltimore. Surely they could have built ships in New England just as they built ships in Baltimore. 
Surely they could have unloaded ships in Boston and Salem and Providence just as they did in Charleston and Baltimore and Richmond. If slaves could serve on sh crews shipping out of the British Caribbean, they certainly could have served on ships shipping out of New England ports as some did on John Brown ships. If the master of the Cuban ship, the Amistad, could have a slave cabin boy on a ship that was taking slaves from one part of Cuba to the other, then certainly New Englanders could have had slave cabin boys on their ships as well. The New Englanders thrived on their, on their timber and lumber industries. Certainly if blacks could cut timber in South and North Carolina, blacks could cut timber in Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Throughout the 18th century, most middle class families had domestic servants. Domestic life for a middle or upper class family was a heavily labor intensive operation. Slaves worked in the households of Southerners. They worked in the households of most middle class New Yorkers. They surely could have worked in the households of most middle class New Englanders. Uh, slaves were part of the urban economy in Boston, Providence, New Haven, or Newport, and they could, just as they were in New York. In New York, it's estimated that almost all middle class families at the time of the revolution <coughs> held slaves. Why not in New England? As late as 1750, slaves made up 20% of the population of Cambridge. Most of these were domestic servants. Slaves could have been valuable to urban shopkeepers, tradesmen, artisans who needed skilled and semi-skilled and unskilled laborers. The South used slaves as craftsmen, as blacksmiths, as coopers, as carpenters. Surely New Englanders could have done the same. The rum and salted fish shipped out of New England could have been shipped out in barrels and boxes and casks made by slave labor. So when we look at the economies of the North and the South, there is no legitimate claim that slavery was unprofitable in New England. Indeed, the Connecticut River Valley produced tobacco, just as Virginia produced tobacco. Presumably, slave labor could have been growing tobacco in Connecticut, just as it grew it in Virginia and later Kentucky. Another explanation for New England's early abolition concerns numbers. The numbers of slaves in the New England states are small. The argument goes, therefore, abolition was easy. Slavery was weak, therefore it died. Certainly it's true, as I said at the beginning, the numbers do matter. The relatively small number of slaves in New England does affect abolition, does allow for early abolition. But that can't be the explanation, because we could also examine Delaware. Delaware has a relatively small population at the time of the revolution. It has a viable abolition society in the 1780s and 1790s. And indeed, at the Constitutional Convention, the delegates assume that Delaware will ultimately join Pennsylvania and New England in abolishing slavery relatively soon. By the way, at the convention, the delegates assume that New York and New Jersey will not end slavery anytime soon because it is a viable economic <laughs> institution in those places. Yet we know that Delaware is the last slave state to give up slavery, ending it only when the 13th Amendment requires it. By the time of the Civil War, there are probably a lower percentage of slaves in Delaware than there were slaves in New England at the time of the American Revolution. And yet the senators and representatives from Delaware throughout the antebellum period are as pro-slavery as the South Carolinians are. Clearly numbers is not the issue. There is something more than numbers. It has to do ultimately with a culture that New England creates. It's not possible in this short a time uh, or indeed in this venue to go through all of the cultural apparatus of New England but it is quite clear that from the beginning there is something about slavery that doesn't work with the development of New England culture. Part of the paper that we just heard stresses the highly legalistic aspects of slavery in New England. The fact that there are so many statutes regulating the status of slaves in New England is suggestive, I think, of the very way in which slavery doesn't work with a culture that is essentially Puritan. 
The Puritans, of course, are extraordinarily legalistic. The average Puritan man in the first part of the 17th century was involved in six or seven lawsuits in his life. This in a society where there weren't any lawyers practicing their profession. So don't blame it on the lawyers. It's got to do with the essence of American culture and the essence of Puritan culture, the essence of New England culture. These are litigious people. These are legalistic people. These are people who want to have everything written down. And to regulate slavery, they have to write everything down because it doesn't naturally flow from the culture. Now, this doesn't mean that all Puritans are anti-slavery. I think we have to understand distinctions. Obviously, Puritans in the Caribbean and in the Caribbean basin maintained slavery. Puritans were involved in the slave trade. But despite this, there seems to be something deeply unsettling about slavery in New England. Part of it is that the New Englanders were trying, trying to create a homogeneous society, a society that would be Puritan or separatist, a society that could prepare initially for the second coming of Christ, later for uh, more bourgeois interests and uh, more culturally coherent interests. But in this context, slaves are outsiders. A culture that doesn't like outsiders, that resists outsiders, it replicates itself perhaps in the 19th century with the resistance to Irish immigration as well. It's a culture where slavery doesn't fit because the slaves are outsiders. I think it's instructive that New Englanders, when they enslave Indians, ship them out of the colony for the most part because they don't want them here. And the one attempt in New England at, at dealing with Indians is, again, instructive. Dartmouth College is, in a sense, an attempt to create an institution where Indians be can become Puritanized and become good New Englanders. And there is always that possibility throughout New England culture. So I think, to a great extent, slavery is weak in New England because it doesn't fit with the ideal culture that New Englanders are trying to create. In addition, of course, there are some other aspects. Edmund Morgan writes brilliantly in his book, uh, American Slavery, American Freedom, about the essential laziness of the Virginians. The English who came to Virginia were there to replicate a hierarchical society that they left in England, a society in which they could have a landed aristocracy and a kind of medieval serf system slavery fit very well into the culture they were trying to create. John Winthrop, however, also described in some of Morgan's work, and the other New Englanders who he describes are not lazy. They think hard work is important. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. They understand that you must do at least some work yourself, even if you are an aristocrat and you have servants. And so again, a slave culture doesn't fit with this kind of culture. Another strand of New England culture is, of course, the emphasis on education and religion. Uh, New England remains the center of American education to this day, and that is because education was central to the mission of the people who settled New England, as was religion. Southern Christians, with the exception of Quakers and the pre-revolutionary South, were comfortable with a religious hierarchy and with slavery. The Puritans and their radical offshoots, such as the Baptist followers of Roger Williams, were instinctively hostile to such hierarchy. In the South, Anglican priests could pray for their flock. Puritan and ba Baptist ministers prayed with their congregations. And though ultimately the Baptists would be successful in, in the South, that comes at a later time. The Methodists would also be successful, but they would have to jettison their anti-slavery uh, ideology to do so. Colonial Southerners, on the other hand, were reluctant to incorporate slaves into their religion, whereas Puritans believed that everybody had to attend church. So, again, the statutes allowing for, the, for, the, for slaves to become Christians but not giving them 
the opportunity to sue for their freedom, there was a similar stat statute in Virginia, is suggestive in part, I think, of the strong desire of Puritans to bring everybody into the church. This filtered down to the slaves. In addition, of course, the Puritans required an educated religious society. People had to be able to read their Bible. Thus we found, we find Moses Brown paid tutors to instruct his slaves in reading and writing, and he took him, them to his church on Sundays. It is simply impossible to imagine a southern planter, a southern aristocrat, paying tutors to teach his slaves. He might teach one or two slaves to read because that would be convenient. And of course, by the antebellum period, such behavior was illegal, even though some masters ignored the law. Uh, New Englanders, of course, along with Quakers, were the first to attack slavery. Samuel Sewell's The Selling of Joseph in 1701 is the earliest attack outside of uh, a few Quakers in the, in the 1680s. It should not surprise us that this book is published in Boston. Sewell was a judge, a member of the governor's council. He was a powerful figure in Massachusetts. It is utterly impossible to imagine a Virginian or a South Carolinian of that status attacking slavery that early or even much later. It would not be until the 1790s that one Virginia judge, St. George Tucker, would openly attack slavery in a pamphlet. The Virginia aristocracy is not interested in attacking what makes the aristocracy an aristocracy. New Englanders are comfortable doing it. Sewell is a racist. He is not a racial egalitarian, but we shouldn't expect that someone in 1701 would have been a racial egalitarian. The important thing, I think, for my, our purposes here is that Sewell sees slavery as incompatible with the society that he has created, and he points out that man-stealing to use the biblical term, is a heinous crime in biblical law that must not be allowed. Most New Englanders, of course, do not heed Sewell's advice, but nevertheless, we see emerging in New England a decidedly racially egalitarian culture within the context of the 18th century. We remember the death of Crispus Attucks because it places a black man at the center of this crucial moment in the Boston Massacre and the beginning of the Revolution. I think for our purposes, however, Crispus Attucks illustrates something else, which is that at the center of this mob challenging British authority are black people. It is inconceivable to me, I've found no evidence of blacks being at the center of mobs in Richmond or Charleston screaming for liberty. Charleston uh, aristocracy would have had none of it. But in New England, it is permissible for blacks, and we don't know whether Attucks was a slave or a former slave, but it's permissible for blacks to be f lining up with whites to argue for liberty on the eve of the revolution. Um, I think this is what makes us pause and ask what caused the early abolition of slavery in New England? And the answer, I think, ultimately is a cultural answer. The how, the process of it, is something we know better. Uh, indeed, uh, Arthur Zilversmith's book many years ago on the first emancipation uh, provides enormous detail of the intricacies of the statutes, how they got passed, the arguments in the legislatures leading to abolition. I think, again, it is important to understand that the radicalization of New England in the pre-revolutionary period caused a tension between liberty and property. This, of course, was a tension throughout the American Revolution, and it played out in different ways. Clearly for Virginians, property in slaves was more important than the liberty that appeared in the Declaration of Independence, uh, the Liberty Clause, of course, written by a man who owned more than 150 slaves at the time that he wrote this. But for New Englanders, the Liberty Clause has more validity, it has more resonance. And indeed, it might be possible to argue that New Englanders were less concerned about property rights than Virginians. The sacking of Governor Hutchinson's house, uh, the burning of the Gaspé in Rhode Island, uh, the Boston Tea Party, suggests that New Englanders understood that destroying property may be a revolutionary act that is acceptable. And so it is during the Revolution 
that we see the destruction of a fair amount of property that is property in human beings that goes on in New England. Vermont is traditionally located as the first place to end slavery. Uh, it did so, although not, as most historians have suggested, by an emphatic constitutional provision. In fact, the Vermont Constitution has a gradual abolition provision in it. Um, I have a feeling I may be the only person alive who's read the first couple of Vermont Constitutions because every historian I've read says it abolished it outright. I went to get the clause to cite it and discovered, hey, wait a minute. It's really a gradual process, which means the children of slaves will be born free. Slavery will die out in a generation. In fact, while written as a gradual proposal, Vermont slavery seems to simply have disappeared before Vermont becomes a state. And in the first sentence, census for Vermont, there are no slaves. Uh, the process in Massachusetts is far more complicated. Uh, slavery is dying in Massachusetts during the Revolution, and I will say a word about that. I have about five more minutes, but I will get to all that in the next five minutes. Uh, the process of, of ending it is in part due to the Revolution. In 1778, Massachusetts proposes a constitution which protects slave property. That constitution is rejected by the Massachusetts town meetings, and many of the town meetings specifically say that they want a constitution that ends slavery but does not protect it. And this, in fact, is what happens. The 1780 Constitution has a provision which says that all people are born free and equal. There is some question whether the delegates expected that to end slavery. Zilversmith, for example, says he doesn't think they did. Uh, I, in fact, think they did. I think that the, the constitutional history is clear that the delegates to the 1780 Convention in Massachusetts had a mandate to end slavery, and they did so. Jeremy Belknap wrote in the 1790s that during the revolution, the public opinion was so strongly in favor of the abolition of slavery that in some of the country towns, votes were passed in town meetings that they would have no slaves among them and that they would not exact of masters any bonds for maintenance of liberated blacks if they should become incapable of supporting their, themselves. In other words, here we have the stingy, skinflint farmers of Massachusetts saying if you'll free your slaves, the town will pick up the tab if they can't support themselves. That's how important it is that we get rid of slavery. And by 1783, through court decisions and the Constitution, slavery was virtually dead in Massachusetts. The same thing incur occurs in New Hampshire, less explicitly, but clearly by 1790, slavery is all but dead in New Hampshire. Connecticut and Rhode Island have substantially more slaves. Perhaps they have a greater fidelity to property. The result are gradual abolition acts passed in 1784 in both places to end slavery in both places. But already, slavery was virtually dead in both places when the gradual abolition acts were passed. The revolution had done this. Um, one of the most important military events of the revolution was the storming of a redoubt at Yorktown by Colonel Alexander Hamilton. This was his moment of victory. Who led the vanguard in that attack? It was the first Rhode Island, which was 75% black. Now, it is fascinating. I, I, I just did some work uh, uh, for a paper at the Gilder Lerman Center at Yale on Hamilton. And none of Hamilton bi Hamilton's biographers mentioned that the troops he was leading were mostly black when he had his heroic moment at Yorktown. Almost none of the standard military histories mention it. And even to my great surprise, Benjamin Quarles, The Negro and the Revolution, doesn't mention the fact that the heroes of this one important event, because once this position was taken, Cornwallis had no option but to surrender, that the heroes of this central moment at Yorktown were, in fact, black troops from, North, from Rhode Island. But the point that there were so many black troops from Rhode Island fighting undermines slavery severely. It is very difficult to re-enslave people when they come home holding a musket. They're simply not going to accept it, and they're not going to accept the enslavement of their relatives. By the end of the Revolution, slavery was dying in New England. The Gradual Abolition Acts would allow it to linger, but the lingering was relatively quick. In 1790, there were 3,763 slaves in all of New England out of a total of over 16,000 blacks. That is, the vast majority of blacks were already free. 
By 1800, there were only 1,300 slaves in New England. And by 1810, there were only 418 slaves in New England, 108 in Rhode Island, and 310 in Connecticut, all born before the Gradual Abolition Act. In addition to ending slavery in New England, the states went on to use laws and litigation to oppose slavery throughout the period leading up to the Civil War. I think it is no surprise to us that it was Massachusetts and Commonwealth versus Aves in 1836 where a northern state said, we will free any slave voluntarily brought into this, our state. New York and Pennsylvania, for example, had given masters the right to keep their slaves in those states for nine months in New York and six months in Pennsylvania as visitors. Massachusetts said, you bring your slave here, your slave is instantly free. Connecticut followed in 1837 in a similar decision. Maine got into a huge controversy with Georgia over the status of Maine sailors who had helped slaves escape to Maine in the 1830s. Ultimately, these New England states became centers of radical abolition and of anti-slavery. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court may have upheld segregation in Boston v. Roberts v. Boston in 1850, but within five years, the state legislature would, of course, make segregation illegal in all of Massachusetts. Finally, the coda to this legal assault on slavery is, of course, the statute proposed by Charles Sumner passed posthumously the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which was the most sweeping piece of civil rights legislation in American history until the 1964 Civil Rights Act. I think that one can find in the culture of New England the roots of Sumner's attack not only on slavery but on racial discrimination. This is a history that is complicated, it is one that requires us to remember slavery in New England, but also understand what the roots are that led to the end of slavery. If we are looking, as much of this conference seems to be, for a usable past, if we are looking for a past that we can return to and learn from, then I think there are two messages. One is the message that slavery was here and New Englanders have forgotten that. But the other message is that there was a time when New England led the nation in the search for civil rights. And perhaps that is also a past that New Englanders can seek to recover. Thank you. Papers entitled Legal Emancipations of Leander and Caesar, Manumission and the Law of Revolutionary of South Carolina and Massachusetts. In 1771, a Massachusetts slave named Caesar finally ended his long struggle for freedom. His battle began in the 1760s. He had negotiated with at least three of his previous owners and pitted two of them against each other in, order, in an effort to become free. Little is known about Caesar and his first two owners, except that he personally negotiated with the third owner, Samuel Taylor, to purchase him from his second owner, Captain Edward Herkham. Caesar, a skilled tanner, offered to pay Taylor 100 pounds a year for six years if Taylor would purchase him and then free, them, free him at the end of the six-year term. The agreement was sure to line Taylor's pockets because Caesar cost him merely 80 pounds. But after only a few months, Taylor began to have second thoughts, for Caesar appeared to have a combative relationship with his owners. Eventually, Taylor decided that he was no longer worth the trouble and sold Caesar to Walter Smith. Smith told Caesar that he could purchase his freedom for $172, but Caesar denied that Smith owned him at all. Caesar believed that due to his deal with Taylor, that he was no longer a slave, but a laborer paying off a contract. He sued Taylor for illegally selling him, a free man, and won his case in the Superior Court of Judica, Judea, in the Superior Court, sorry. Um, Leander, a South Carolina slave, also worked hard to negotiate his freedom and finalized it through a legal action in 1770. Leander and his owners, William and Susanna Mason, lived in Charleston where Leander was a successful butcher. He made a deal with Jacob Williman to purchase him and free him. 
Leander's work as a butcher brought him extra money, and Leander was able to pay Willimon from time to time as monies became available. On October 8, 1770, Willimon paid the Masons 900 pounds he had received from Leander to purchase him. Willimon accompanied Masons to the Secretary of State's office to legalize the deed of sale. Three days later, Willimon returned to the Secretary of State's office, where he submitted an official deed that would hereby enfranchise, manumise, and let free the said fellow Leander. It's a quote. Leander and Caesar, two slaves who lived under very different bodies of slave law, used similar strategies to become free. Because their original masters refused to allow them to purchase themselves, they negotiated and contracted with another white to purchase their freedom. Leander and Caesar were both participants in a new era of manumissions. Before the era of the American Revolution, manumission procedures in both states were quite similar. Slaves with approximately the same frequency became free in similar ways. In both colonies before the Revolution, slaves became legally free primarily through individual wills. The Revolutionary Era ended that similarity. Caesar and Leander's final act in gaining legal recognition of their emancipation was the essential difference between the two experiences of slaves in revolutionary Massachusetts and South Carolina. Le Caesar's legal action, a lawsuit, differed in quality from Leander's legal action, registration. Ironically, Caesar's legal action represents a near failure in manumission, whereas Leander's legal action was the culmination of a smooth and successful manumission attempt. Had Taylor lived up to his agreement, Caesar would not have appeared in any legal records. The courts only became involved in Caesar's case because Taylor refused to uphold his end of the contract. Importantly, the courts were there to support the failed contract between Caesar and Taylor. Leander, in contrast, had no such pre-existing legal protections and had to register his new status with the state. Each of their final actions, suing and registering, was a significant part of the legal activity of slaves during the era of the American Revolution. As more slaves heard the rhetoric of liberty, the more South Carolina and Massachusetts slaves strove to become free. In Massachusetts, these efforts led to a riot in freedom suits, cases in which slaves sue their masters for freedom. In South Carolina, the total number of registered slaves rose from 132 in 1765 to 317 379 in 1785. These registrations and lawsuits not only charge, chart the increase in activity by the slaves to achieve freedom, but also highlight some fundamental differences in the law of slavery that arose between South Carolina and Massachusetts during the Revolutionary period. In Massachusetts, the ability of slaves to sue and the environment of the American Revolution changed the legal culture of slavery and particularly manumission so that this fundamental difference of law would lead to opposite fates for all slaves in South Carolina and Massachusetts. The rhetoric of the revolution inspired slaves in Massachusetts and South Carolina to challenge their enslavement, but Massachusetts slaves could go through the courts, and these slaves' use of legal opportunities would uh, eventually end slavery in the state. Despite the change that these two stories suggest, Caesar and Leander had similarly difficult routes to freedom. Their occupations helped them to become free. Like most slaves, Caesar and Leander craved freedom, but unlike most slaves, they had specialized occupational skills that made them, that they could use to become free. Skilled urban slaves were, as Philip Morgan states, suspended between two worlds of master and slave. The suspension gave urban skilled slaves the ability to earn money and also gave them the ability to um, have closer relationships with whites. And the cooperation of Willimon and Taylor was essential to the slaves' plans. This opportunity did not arise for most slaves. Urban skilled slaves' suspension between the white and slave worlds gave them ample opportunity to make extensive connections with whites outside of their master's household. Boston and Charleston offered slaves many occasions to interact with a variety of blacks and whites. Urban slaves had access to whites for not only not only frequently, but they could also develop long-term relationships in which they developed the respect and trust of the slave. Willimon and Leander, for example, had maintained a, for several years a relationship in which Leander delivered money to Willimon. 
The nature of Caesar's initial relationship is not well known, but we can surmise that he had enough interaction to negotiate terms and freedom for freedom from Hercum. Their positions not only gave Caesar and Leander increased interpersonal connections to whites, but also greater access to government and legal structures. This access was particularly significant to Caesar as the court system protected his interests. Most rural slaves did not have the same knowledge or physical access to the court system. Caesar had to hire a lawyer, get to the clerk's office, and with the lawyer's help, file a suit. This set of activities took a significant amount of knowledge, mobility, and loose supervision. Moreover, Caesar lived in Boston, where the black population was perhaps the most legal, legally savvy enslaved population in America. His strong connections with both the black and white worlds benefited him. Most significantly, a few other blacks served as witnesses in Caesar's case, testifying against Caesar's master. In contrast, no person of African descent, be they enslaved, freed, or freeborn, could testify against whites in South Carolina. Leander, too, found some security in the legal deed filed with the Secretary of State's office. The official recognition of his freedom in the state records would protect Leander from being resold into slavery. Leander's action was not a solitary one either. Many other blacks registered their emancipation, and their numbers would spike as revolutionary ideology spread to South Carolina's black and whites. Rural slaves, as I said before, did not have such opportunity to secure their, deed by, their freedom by deed. Since South Carolina's government was centered in Charleston, blacks who lived on remote low country or back country plantations usually remained untutored in the ways of the government. Law for rural slaves was local and run by self-interested planters in the magistrate courts where slaves' interests were rarely supported. Lastly, both Leander and Caesar became free in the era of the American Revolution, a context key to opening up the opportunities for freedom. Both states saw a dramatic increase in the number of emancipations, and according to traditional excuse me, According to traditional scholarship, slavery was under attack or in influx during this period practically everywhere except the low country. Although the number of emancipations in South Carolina were the lowest in any state, white South Carolinians did emancipate their slaves in unprecedented numbers during the revolutionary period. The historian's richest source for manumissions is the Secretary of State's miscellaneous records. In these records, South Carolina owners publicly recorded these transactions. There are 370 manumissions in these records, and between 1737 and 1765, oh, there's 379 manumissions between 1737 and 1785. Of those, 199, or 53% of them, happened in the one decade between 1775 and 1785. Of course, this increase does not compare to other states like Virginia, Pennsylvania, or of course, Massachusetts, but it's still significant. Before the revolutionary era, the process and experience of manumission in South Carolina and Massachusetts was quite similar. Like South Carolina, Massachusetts required their masters to register slaves with their freed slaves with their town and required the masters to post a bond of 50 pounds, a cost close to the price of a slave. Uncomfortable with a rising free black population, this bond curbed manumissions. Since freed blacks became members of their ex-master's town, the major fear was that free blacks would become unemployed and therefore a burden to towns. This bond, often more than the cost of a new slave, seemed to curb emancipation. Massachusetts never had a large free black population, even in proportion to its slave population. Thus, on the eve of the American Revolution, South Carolina and Massachusetts both possessed legal roadblocks to manumission. Both colonies, there is no doubt, also held many enslaved men and women who yearned to be free. Slaves in Massachusetts, however, were able to use the changes wrought by the American Revolution to end slavery and slavery in their new, newly formed slate, whereas only a fraction of the state, excuse me, slaves in South Carolina managed to secure manumission. The second half of today's paper suggests how important differences in slave law in the two states help account for these very divergent outcomes.
South Carolina pl law placed slaves within a separate legal system run by slave owners. Slaves could only serve as witnesses when the white magistrates thought appropriate. Access to South Carolina's primary court system came only when a white man represented the slave's interests. In short, South Carolina law reluctantly recognized blacks only when compelled to do so by white legal action. South Carolina law assumed all blacks were slaves and therefore made manumission difficult. The famous Code of 1740 did not restrict manumissions, but it did strengthen requirements to document free status. The Code deemed all Negroes, quote, Negroes, Indians, mulattoes, and mestizos to be, quote, absolute slaves. As a result, the Code harshly punished slaves moving about without written permission of their master. Free blacks required written proof of their status to protect themselves from whipping or re-enslavement. The document needed came from the Secretary of State's office. For a small fee, usually five shillings, a clerk would create a public record of this private transaction. The record of the Secretary of State's office was almost the law, the limit of the law, the limit of how the law could protect Leander. In only three instances did slaves reach the South Carolina courts in the 18th century to contest an illegal enslavement. South Carolina slaves, unable to bring a suit of their own, unable to witness against a white person, and unable to even own property, found the court system pr practically inaccessible, even for those living in Charleston. Luckily, Caesar, Leander's ally, unlike Caesar, Caesar's, was honest and applied his money toward his freedom. Caesar had protection under Massachusetts law that Leander lacked. Because Leander could not legally sign a contract or own property, any agreement made between Leander and Williman was legally impotent. Had Le Williman refused to purchase Leander, the slave would have had no way of recovering the funds unless another white applied informal pressure. It is therefore not a stretch to imagine that many slaves who made similar deals did not have agents as trustworthy as Williman and lost their savings with no legal recourse. The number of of slaves who had trusted their life savings to a white benefactor never to find freedom remains unknown. South Carolina slaves used the opportunities from the American Revolution to press for freedom. Since slaves could not fight for the patriot cause, the only legal act avenue were these negotiated manumissions that end with a deed. Um, there, and, th and those people who had the deed were much more secure than any other freed person in the state. Not all freed blacks had legal documentation. In 1790, the U.S. Census recorded that 1,801 free black, there were 1,801 free blacks in South Carolina, but only 400 had res registered their deeds with the state. Many slaves probably had a, or many freed people probably had a written note from their master, which had to be backed up by a person, so the owner would have to be there. There are, all, there are many examples of deeds that are, um, that are from people whose de masters are away. So one way, if, you, if your master had moved away, like a lot of loyalist slaves who had loyalist masters, they used uh, the deeds as a way to, be, to assure their freedom um, because there wasn't an actual person to do so. The people who tended to use these, uh, the, the deeds uh, sort of tell us who um, were able to become free during this period. Um, the power that these slaves had to become free varied. The power depended on personal ties, access to money, and other whites, and sex. The slaves most often who became free were concubine women, master's children, body servants, and artisans. Concomitant with slavery was the sexual exploitation of female slaves, and because, of these, asso because these associations were taboo, the deeds were discreet about specific relationships. But the language and racial markers hint at strongly at blood and sexual relations. Several male masters freed their Negro female slaves and their mulatto children. Masters also offered freedom to personal servants and artisans. These sl slaves could draw on personal, on dense personal relationships with their masters. It was common for owners to cite the fidelity, care, and good service of their slaves. Artisans with special skills and an ability to earn cash could purchase their freedoms. Other slaves, especially the strong young male field, field laborers, had no access to these opportunities and had to resort to other illegal means to become free.
The opportunities for self-purchase rose during the war when slave labor became more valuable. And whether aiding in the war as on, by maintaining the plantation or by um, doing skilled labor, there was a lot of opportunity to make money. And a third of these deeds reflect that because a third of the deeds are um, reflect that the, the slave purchased their freedom. But no freedom-hungry slave could free himself. It required a willing master. As Leander's example demonstrated, the skilled slave often gained the respect and confidence of whites inside and outside of the household, which aided the quest for freedom. Massachusetts law, especially during the Revolutionary Era, could protect a slave and did not restrict slaves or African Americans from the court, except as jurors. Slaves and blacks in Massachusetts had about the same legal rights as an unmarried woman. They could own property, sue, marry, petition, and be witnesses. These relatively liberal laws opened up the court as a potential protector of blacks' rights. But the, but the court only became consistently friendly to these suits when tensions with the British flared and Enlightenment ideology prevailed. Slaves in Massachusetts exploited this turn of events. The freedom suit, like that which Caesar brought, became the primary and most significant form of legal activity for slaves in Massachusetts during the Revolutionary Era. In both states, <laughs> slaves became free through wills, indentures, and silk purchase. But these routes to freedom paled in significance compared to the freedom suits. For, through these cases, slaves ended their own enslavement in Massachusetts. A few slaves sued with mixed results before the American Revolution. But as tension with the British flared, the number of cases skyrocketed. At least 24 slaves sued their masters in the 20 years between 1763 and 1783. This escalation is especially dramatic considering the interruptions that the intolerable acts and the war itself brought to the orderly administration of justice. And this is where I urge you, I have a handout here where you can see basically the distribution by decade of the freedom suits. Um, there's six in the first six decades and then there's 25 for the last three. Um, slaves brought cases during this revolutionary era for a variety of reasons but only 11 cases offer enough documentation to divulge the basis of the slave's claim that he or she were free. Of those, six claimed to have made contracts of emancipation with dishonest owners. Two claimed free parentage, and three argued that slavery was illegal in Massachusetts. Massachusetts was one of the few states that supported a slave's right to enter a contract, which explains why most freedom suits were contractual. In contrast, Virginia, which had a flurry of freedom suits after the war, almost all of the suits related to free parentage. Virginia's law clearly stated that a mother bestowed her status on her child, thus free parentage being the primary reason. Massachusetts accepted this idea in custom, but not law, which is a prob probably the reasons why fewer slaves argued free descent as grounds for emancipation. The three cases in which slaves sued on the basis of slavery was illegal in the state were tied to the revolution in an unexpected way and demonstrate the patriots' reticence to become attached to the cause. Daniel Bitt, Bliss and Jonathan Sewell, the plaintiff's lawyers in Newport versus Billing and James versus Lechmere would both become loyalists and oppose slavery. Their arguments hinged on slavery's, slavery's illegality. The first case, Newport lost, but James won, suggesting that the people of Massachusetts were becoming ready to abolish slavery in the state. The revolutionary agenda, the white revolutionary agenda, however, did not include freeing enslaved Africans. Even in New England, as Patricia Badley makes clear, the revolutionary leaders did not intend to extend the metaphor of slavery to the black population. In fact, most of the lawyers who defended the master's interests were patriots, including John Adams, while loyalists tended to represent the slaves. While a significant number of whites were beginning to challenge slavery, the legislative efforts to end slavery invariably <laughs> failed. In effect, few whites, a few whites did believe in the, that the values of revolution extended to the black population, but the revolutionary leadership of Massachusetts did not. The defendants' lawyers, the revolutionaries, 
frequently talked about the sanctity of property rights and tried to, de to demonstrate that slavery was a natural and, et and eternal institution. In contrast, loyalist justice, Peter Oliver, engaged the, con the quote, contest between liberty and property and it concluded that liberty was more important. If most patriots were unable or unwilling to extend their agenda to slavery, the same was clearly not true of enslaved men and women who interpreted the universal libertarian message to include themselves. This language inspired activism among blacks to end slavery, um, as Hor um, Professor Horton talked a lot about last night. There's a series of petitions, and we also have these cases. We don't know the, we know some of the lawyers' words, but we don't know the words of the enslaved men and women involved in these freedom suits, but their actions reflect, as do the petitions, that they saw themselves in a time of freedom. As with whites, even this story is too simple. In the earliest revolutionary era cases, slaves sued because of personal illegal enslavement. Our subject, Caesar, did not advocate the end of slavery, but of his own enslavement. Likewise, most other slaves who sued for freedom did not challenge the institution. By avoiding the questioning the validity of slavery and by suing on the basis of illegal enslavement, cases in the 1760s and 1770s bolstered the legality of enslavement by stating that there's an illegal form of slavery, there's an implicit understanding that there's a legal form of slavery. Nonetheless, these cases had a destabilizing effect on the institution of slavery by establishing a positive environment for freedom litigation. As John Adams recalled in 1795, I never knew a jury by verdict to determine a Negro to be a slave. They always found them free. In the 1780s, as the war wound down, slaves became louder and clearer in their demands for freedom, and revolutionary leaders could consider abolition as a fulfillment of their country's ideals. Mumbet and Brahms sued their master, John Ashley, in 1781 because they, with their lawyer, Theodore Sedgwick, believed that the Constitution deemed the con uh, slavery illegal. And as has been pointed out last night, that case won. But that case, th that case would then be followed by a case in the highest court, and that's the case of Quack Walker versus Jennison in 1781, which also argued that the new state constitution stated that men were born free and equal. Walker's complicated case weaved in and out of the Superior Court for two years. But in 1783, Commonwealth versus, of Massachusetts versus Jennison, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts pronounced Quack Walker and other, all other slaves in Massachusetts free. In that stroke, the court transformed Massachusetts from the first colony to legalize slavery into the first state to immediately deny its citizenry the right to hold human property. This famous case has received a fair share of debate, unnecessary to recount here, but my reading of this case and subsequent legal history of Massachusetts, it becomes clear that this legally ended slavery in Massachusetts. Despite this change and the successful outcomes of Walker and Bett cases, the practice of slavery only slowly evaporated. It took, it took up to seven years for masters to reluctantly give in to the demands of the enslaved to be free. There was no Emancipation Day. In fact, it was not clear that black slavery had ended until the 1790 census reported that Massachusetts had no slaves remaining in the state. Both Caesar and Leander clawed their way to legal freedom. They both became free from, and had help from whites to do so. But these legal acts that made them free could not have been more different, nor could they have had such opposing consequences. Leander protected his freedom in a place that offered him virtually no legal protection by applying for a deed. It was the culmination of a long and successful effort to become free. Caesar's case was a long and almost failed effort to become free. Caesar, however, had a legal system that did provide some protection of his freedom by providing him the right to own property, engage in contracts to his master, and have other white blacks witness in his case. And although Caesar was not attacking the institution of slavery, his act and that of others like him provided a foundation for the emancipation of slaves throughout the state. Leander, unfortunately, would remain anomaly in a state that responded to slaves' quest for freedom within an oppressive legal system that would be even more harshly enforced after the end of the American Revolution. Okay. Um.
Can you hear me? Yes, nodding. The story of slavery in the American South, its beginnings, endings, and aftermath, an aftermath that many believe extends until today, looms so large in the American consciousness, we scarcely remember that almost from the very beginning, African slavery was a feature of life in every region of early America. That is why this conference presents such an important opportunity to remind us that although they participated in different ways and for different lengths of time, white Americans, first as British subjects and then as American citizens from the North and the South, had a hand in making child slavery a stubborn feature of the American landscape for almost three centuries. The papers we have just heard show the centrality of law in simultaneously reflecting and helping to shape various northern colonies' experiments with slavery during the colonial and revolutionary periods. An experiment seems an appropriate word. Slavery did not last long enough and become extensive enough to turn New England colonies into full-fledged slave societies on the order of their southern counterparts. Paul Finkelman considers why they did not and offers several provocative answers to the questions uh, to why, which I will address later on. But the overall picture that emerges from these papers is that of societies, particularly after the American Revolution, that had slavery in various forms, but that were unwilling to go the distance to make slavery a permanent fixture of their way of life. And what of those experiments with slavery, and what was Law's role in fashioning them? Sounding a theme that is echoed in the papers of his co-panelists, James Allegro, writing about slavery's beginnings, posits that it is a mistake to think of regions as having unique and coherent bodies of law that separated them from other regions. Allegro might say, all slave laws were local. Within regions, each province, Allegro's term, enacted laws that suited their own circumstances, and their circumstances were not necessarily those of their most immediate neighbors. Massachusetts slave law could look quite like New York's laws, more so than Connecticut law, Connecticut's laws. The circumstances that helped to create the distinctive features of Massachusetts law were the suspension of the colonial charter, the institution of the Dominion of England, and the administration of the royal governor, Edmund Andros. Allegro suggests that under the Dominion, the colonists learned, or so they thought, what it was like to be ruled arbitrarily to be treated in effect, or so they thought, just like slaves. After the Glorious Revolution and the end of the Dominion, and under the threat of war, the colonists turned to law to protect their, their rights, and they turned with a vengeance when it came to defining the lives of the slaves among them. Very much like Edmund Morgan's Virginians, the Massachusetts colonists defended their freedoms by restricting those of their slaves. A similar process, Allegro notes, took place in New York, another state under the Dominion, and Maryland, in which Lord Baltimore had his own form of a Dominion and seems to have been as autocratic as Andros in Massachusetts and Duncan in New York. Allegro, Allegro's point seems sound. Who better to understand the relationship between law and notions of freedom than those who used law and coercion to deny the freedom of others? Wouldn't they have turned to law to codify their hopes and fears? As I mentioned above, historians have long noted the tendency of white members of slave-owning societies to define freedom by reference to the denial of blacks' freedoms. Certainly, after an experiment with the loss of civic rights, it would make sense to at least try to ensure that it would never happen again. Dealing with the blacks within their midst would also seem a natural outcome of the, recess, the reassessment of everyone's position in society. But I wondered as I read Allegro's piece, what else might have been going on during the years 1680 to 1720 that may have affected the substance of the laws they decided to write? Did demographics, that dread word, play a role? How many black people were in Massachusetts before the Dominion and after it? More black people might mean more anxiety. The greater their anxiety, the greater the need to control. To what extent did these changes represent a renewed commitment to slavery, a renewed commitment but ultimately not a temporary one, which is not quite the same thing 
as a reaction against Stewart-inspired absolutism. After all, most, if not all, of the provisions enacted between 1680 and 1720 in Massachusetts, New York, and Maryland appeared in virtually all slave-owning societies in North America at one point or another. The debasement of blacks' civic status, hostility toward interracial couplings in marriage, the attempt to separate blacks from firearms, as well as other provisions that were part and parcel of the North American construction of African slavery. These types of laws arose in settings with the dominion and without. Some existed in different forms before the period under consideration. Still, Allegro's overall point is surely correct. Deciding how they did not want to be treated and how they did not want to live gave colonists a clue about how to use law to construct diminished lives for the blacks among them. If James Allegro invites us to consider legislative intent, intent in shaping slave law in the early New England and northern states, Emily Blank focuses on how individuals sought to use law to affect changes in their circumstances. What makes the two individuals who are the subjects of her consideration, Caesar and Leander, such powerful and poignant figures, figures is the spectacle of two people designated by law as species of property turning to law to formally establish their humanity. If one has any doubt about law's capacity to shape expectations, to make people hope, even under the most extreme circumstances, Caesar and Leander's stories go a long way toward overcoming them. Given their circumstances, it is hard to imagine how these two men could summon so much faith in the law and in the people around them who enslaved them, whom they relied upon to negotiate the tricky terrain upon which they existed. So much of the writing about slavery centers upon whites' attitudes <coughs> towards blacks and much less consideration of blacks' attitudes towards whites. Both Caesar and Leander, despite the gulf cr created between them and their white benefactors because of racially based <coughs> slavery, were forced to put their trust in members of a race that enslaved them. One longs to know what they were thinking. How did they determine Caesar, it turns out, wrongly, that they would be able to trust the individuals who took their money and promised to buy them and then free them. Even without detail, detailed knowledge of their dealings, the circumstances indicate the level of contact and interaction that must have existed between blacks and whites in this society. Slavery was an economic system, but it was a relentlessly social system at, as well. And Caesar's and Leander's situations display this quite clearly. Like Allegro, Blank notes the influence of a pivotal event in the lives of each man's community that helped shape their attitudes about the relevance of law in their lives. Allegro's Bay Colonist experiences of the Dominion and the Glorious Revolution told them what they wanted from the law. According to Blank, the American Revolution that would bring new laws and a new order told blacks and whites what they wanted from law. While it's true that Caesar's Massachusetts devalued, devalued the civic status of blacks, as Allegro noted, Leander's South Carolina was even worse. The dispute over Caesar's informal contract with Taylor was, after all, heard in a Massachusetts court. From blank we see the very important point that there was no one-size-fits-all version of slavery. Again, the southern image of slavery, agrarian, cotton-dominated, has obscured the lives of people like Caesar and Leander, who had the fortune, if one could say that those born slaves could be fortunate, to have been highly skilled urban dwellers who were as much a part of the workings of their communities as were southern agricultural workers. They were uncommon in that they were able to gain their freedom somewhat on their own terms. Caesar had difficulties, but their situations were much better than their enslaved fellows. Adding to their chances was the fact that they pressed their suits for freedom during the time of revolution, when courts may have been at their most receptive to hearing the claims. Blank notes an ironic consequence of Caesar's and Leander's freedom suits. They tended to legitimize the institution of slavery since neither of them challenged slavery overall, just their own right to be free. This supported the notion that there was a legal basis of slavery. It was just wrong for them to be a part of it. 
There could be no legitimate criticism of the men, however, for taking this tack or trying to seize this opportunity. Their actions were extraordinary, and they were extraordinarily lucky to be in the position to even to make the attempt. In the comparison between Massachusetts and South Carolina, their different constructions of slavery, their different responses to the American Revolution, we see one society that had slavery, harbored negative attitudes about blacks, but had so tenuous a connection to slavery that the rhetoric of revolution was enough to end the institution. Then we have South Carolina that was too embedded within slavery, within slavery's hold to be moved by the language of universal liberty. Still, Willimon in South Carolina decided to abide by his agreement with Leander. Taylor from liberal Massachusetts reneged. Leander was left to depend upon the good faith of an individual. Caesar had to have faith too, but he had the advantage of having access to law when his faith turned out to have been misplaced. What comes across so clearly in Blank's, Blank's piece is that the desire for freedom was so great in some slaves that they were willing to take the huge risk to work, hope, and trust. These men, in the right place and at the right time, as so many of their other fellows were not, acted on behalf of themselves. As Blank noted, it is impossible to know how many other slaves did the same with nowhere near as successful a result. We are grateful then to have the example of these two men and the others who tried to negotiate freedom on their own terms, who almost certainly represent what many of their fellows would like to have achieved if they had had the chance. Paul Finkelman asked why and how did this all end? New England and Pennsylvania took a different path with regard to slavery, deciding relatively early along in the new American nation to abandon the institution. Finkelman rejects what he characterizes as the too facile resort to demography, geography, and economics to explain this turn of events. When taken together under the traditional view, they point toward the alleged unprofitability of slavery in New England and the North as the reason for its slavery's demise. Finkelman reminds us that slaves like Blanks, Caesar, and Leander performed a myriad of tasks beyond the agricultural labor that has become the defining, almost iconic image of slavery in the South. Slaves could have continued to work on ships, been put to work in industries in the North and New England. Why weren't they? What about the numbers? Did the relatively small numbers of slaves in New England mean that slavery did not matter in the North and was vulnerable uh, to the strong challenge posed by the American Revolution? Finkelman offers the example of Delaware, a small slave-owning state with a small slave population, which adamantly refused to end slavery until the passage of the 13th Amendment. Finkelman settles on culture, specifically the Puritan culture based, um, the Puritan culture of New England as furnishing the strongest explanation for slavery's disappearance in New England, in, in New England. New England had a different sense of self, a Puritan sense of self, that gave them a different vision of themselves. It's not for nothing that we refer to the Puritan ethic. This makes sense, for culture does matter. New Englanders, for reasons of religion, political views, values, everything that can be said to make up a culture, were simply less wedded to slavery than were Virginians and other Southerners. A somewhat ironic result of Finkelman's analysis is that New Englanders come off as more averse to physical proximity to blacks than Southerners, who, who Southerners, blacks, who Southerners imported in large numbers to work not only in their fields, but in their homes in as close proximity to their masters as did slaves working in northern households. I agree that economics, geography, and demographics don't explain it all. But we should, in our discussion, and I'm sure we will, ask whether substituting culture as the driving force behind the dissolution of slavery in New England is a better answer. Look at it this way. While it is true that slaves could have been put to work in New England doing lots of other things, I wonder if the economic rewards created by the Southern plantation system, uh, slave system 
which was the anchor of the Southern economy, existing along with the other work Finkelman describes, outstripped the rewards to be gained by having blacks in the lumber industry or serving as cabin boys or making barrels. What, given the technology and the terrain of the time in New England, would have been a suitable analog to the plantations of the South? Well, maybe the New Englanders didn't want that system, um, didn't want the similar system that they had in the South, or maybe they wanted it but could not have it because of their physical circumstances, in which case it wouldn't have made sense for them to want it if they couldn't have it, and it would never become a part of their cultural outlook. Culture matters, but culture is almost invariably shaped by economic, geographic, and demographic influences. There was no culture of African chattel slavery in England, but when Englishmen came to the United States, they adapted quickly, particularly when the economic incentives were large enough to make them do so. We can and should incorporate Fink Finkelman's correct attention to New England's particular vision of themselves and how that influenced their relationship to slavery. And we should bring this along with previous understandings about why northern states in New England turned their back on slavery, explanations that include demographics, geography, and, is, and economics. I found myself wanting to know, as I read Finkelman's piece, more about Delaware. Rather than using that state as a way to turn aside the conventional model describing why slavery died in New England and the North, it may be fruitful to turn to train a more a clearer eye on Delaware. Every model will have an an anomaly, and that anomaly won't always turn aside the insights to be gleaned from the model. Still, Finkelman's focus on Delaware is cause for caution when generalizing about the preconditions for maintaining slavery within a given society. I would urge Finkelman to go further in considering just what was up with Delaware. Of course, it may, be, it may turn out that he is right. Um, it would be it would certainly greatly under, um, expand my, existent, my almost non-existent knowledge of that state's history, of course. It may turn out that he is right. Delaware does refute the conventional wisdom about the death of slavery in the North but I would like to know more about this. In sum, these papers present us with extremely instructive views into a part of our history too long forgotten, or probably for most Americans, not known. It is crucial to examine how slavery began in New England and in the North, to consider how it, it was lived by the people most directly affected by it, and then to analyze how various states use law to extricate themselves from their reliance on the peculiar institution. The stories in these papers should take their place alongside the more famous stories of slaveholding in the South. Only then will we have a true picture of slavery as the all-American institution that it undoubtedly was. So we have uh, about 15 minutes for questions. So um, if anybody would like to ask one, maybe they would, wouldn't mind identifying themselves. And then, um, and if you, if you want to direct it to a particular person or to the panel as a whole, uh, that would be helpful to know too. So you have your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Yes. Do we want to pass this around, do you think? Is that the way to do it? I'll just pass it around. It's called use of I was wondering whether in New England there was more of a white immigrant population that perhaps would have turned um, people away from, uh, or entrepreneurs away from, the necessity to import slaves as different from the southern population, which might not have had um, vast numbers of white immigrants coming in. I, I just wondered if that was a factor at all. I, I think so. Um, I don't think that is helps with the explanation 
because there there's always a need for settlers in a, in a frontier community. And, and it's true that the South has a greater labor shortage in the early period, but of course the South doesn't turn to African labor until 1690s in any serious way. W w up until the 1690s and really probably until the 18th century, most laborers in the South are white indentured servants. And again, we find a, a very different kind of white indentured servant culture in New England uh, and in Pennsylvania, say, than we did in, in the South. I, w I would simply, uh, point in, in slight response to uh, the comments, uh, I would note that the Englishmen who went to Virginia were different Englishmen than the Englishmen who went to, to New England. Uh, for one thing, the English who went to New England were English men and English women, at least in the early period, whereas in Virginia they were all English men. Uh, there were no men, in, there were no women in Virginia for the first couple of years. So I, I just think that it's, they're creating very, very different cultures. Uh, and again, part of it is the desire of New England to be homogeneous, and that does lead to the irony uh, that uh, Southerners are perhaps more comfortable being around blacks, uh, but only if blacks are properly subordinated. Other question? Yes, you have your hand up. Yes, I'm Deborah Cassidy, and I'd like to address my question particularly to Dr. Finkelman. Um, by impl I may have missed this, but by implication, um, P Pennsylvania and New Jersey outlawed slavery at about the same time as New England, around the time of the Revolution? The, 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 the quick history is this, that, that the Vermont Constitution of 1778, which doesn't actually become effective until it becomes a state, has a gradual abolition provision. In 1780, Pennsylvania passes an elaborate gradual abolition statute, which is strengthened in 1788 by uh, amendments to close loopholes. Massachusetts in 1780 adopts a constitution which has an all men are born free and equal clause, which is interpreted by 1783 to have ended slavery in Massachusetts. New Hampshire has the same clause in its 1783 constitution, which leads to an end to slavery. 1784, Connecticut and Rhode Island both passed gradual abolition acts, which, and very quickly the population declines dramatically. New York has a gradual abolition act in 1799, much later, and New Jersey not till 1804. And again, in New York and New Jersey, you have double-digit percentage of slavery up to these gradual abolition acts. So again, it, it, there's a substantial investment. I believe 18% of New Jersey is slaves uh, in 1804. That's a substantial amount of property to be destroying through legislative action. And, and um, my underlying question is, uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey didn't have this Puritan culture, so I was just wondering if very quickly um, there's some um, a additional comment you'd like to make on that. Sure. Well, Pennsylvania has a Quaker culture. Yes. And, that, and, and, that is very different from the Puritan. It, it, is, it is different from a Puritan culture, but in a sense it is, uh, it, it, there's a, I mean the Quakers are the first to condemn slavery. In, in a serious way, and, and, the, and the Quaker culture in Pennsylvania is one that is radically opposed to slavery. However, it is worth noting that the Gradual Abolition Act in Pennsylvania is brought forth by Presbyterians. And again, it's a dissenting Protestant culture, and, and perhaps brought beyond the Puritan culture is a, is, a, is a dissenting Protestant culture in part in Pennsylvania. New Jersey and New York are the most, uh, well, New York anyways, is the most ethnically heterogeneous place in the country. And I think that has something to do with the end of slavery. Uh, New Jersey, it's a close call. Uh, I mean, New Jersey, there, but again, yes, thank you. There is a huge Quaker population in New Jersey. And in fact, some of the Quaker, John Woolman is, is very active in New Jersey. Anthony Benezet is very active in New Jersey. And that, and that leads to to the end of slavery in New Jersey. But New Jersey is a close call. Uh, one of the delegates at the Constitutional Convention from New Jersey is a slaveholder. So they're, they're wedded to it, and it's a, and it's a struggle there uh, between, you know, New Jersey sort of sits between the North and the South, and there is a cultural struggle there. 
Hi, I, uh, my name is Matthew Mason, um, and this is also for Professor Finkelman. Uh, it's kind of follow up to this to this point. I mean, you made the case that uh, slavery was deeply unsettling to, to Puritan culture. There was something about Puritan culture that made slavery <coughs> deeply unsettling. Um, and I just want to, given the isolated nature of someone like C Sewell's uh, selling of Joseph, I mean, that's it's, it's here and then it's gone. It doesn't lead to any kind of anti-slavery movement or anything. Uh, whether it might be better to think about a combination of the ideology of the revolution with these religious ideologies. That that's what makes for a powerful anti-slavery movement. And that privileges, you know, that still privileges these religious cultures, but it, it takes that combination with the political ideology of the revolution. Whether that is, and the timing seems to bear that out. And so I just wondered if you'd like to address that. Uh, I, I hope I'm not being misunderstood as offering a monocausal explanation for what is a very complex social and political change that takes place. Uh, again, I think, as I pointed out with, say, the first Rhode Island, which was 75 percent black, that the revolution is a powerful force in ending slavery. The revolution, by the way, shakes slavery in the South. Uh, in Virginia, there are approximately 2,000 free blacks in 1780. By 1810, there are 30,000 free blacks. Uh, this is the result of thousands of individual slave owners deciding that they believe the words of the Declaration of Independence, even if the author didn't. And, and, and in Maryland, again, uh, slavery declines uh, precipitously in the wake of the revolution, but at some point the decline stops and people get a better sense of, of, of their, their economics. Clearly the economics matter. Again, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make the argument that, that you know, it's just about culture. Slavery was weaker in New England. It was economically less important and it was easier to end it. My point is, in, in discussing the period leading up to the revolution, is the question we need to ask is why don't New Englanders embrace slavery to the extent that people in New Jersey or New York do? You don't need plantations to have a viable slave system. New York City has a greater percentage of slaves in the 1630s than Virginia does. New York, New York City has a huge percentage of slaves on the eve of the revolution. Why doesn't Boston? I mean, I, I think these are things that, 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 that are curious. And there may be no satisfactory single answer. I'm not posing a, satis, a, a single answer. Surely the revolution matters. Uh, but, again, to go back to Crispus Attucks, I'm wondering, what is he doing in that mob? Uh, why is he in that mob? He certainly would not been, a, there were similar mobs in Virginia, there were similar mobs in South Carolina, Charleston mobs, Richmond mobs. We don't see any blacks in those mobs. Clearly something different is happening in New England. Um, I'm going to exercise uh, chair, Chair's privilege and say I think we've had enough questions to Paul Finkelman. A very provocative paper can I, can that I clearly is arousing a great deal of interest. But maybe there are some other. Um, can I add to that to sorry. question? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I just want to. I just want to also say that that um, that Samuel Sewell is not as isolated as it sounds. For instance, one of my lawyers is Jonathan Sewell, who is the nephew of of Samuel Sewell. So there, there is, and there's also some other literature that comes after the selling of Joseph, and there are minister speeches that also denote, although there's not like a, a strong movement of anti-slavery ideas in Massachusetts, there's certainly at least a trickle of discussion about anti-slavery ideas in Massachusetts throughout this period. And of course, Sewell's just... Yeah. Sure. No. Yeah, right. yeah, there's lots of pro-slavery responses. It's a discussion that's going on. So I'm hoping there might be some questions to the other two panelists, maybe. Is that? Yeah, here we go, John. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm John Sweet. Um, this is uh, really for Emily. I wondered if, um, I have a couple thoughts. One, is it seems to me this fight over manumission um, and these legal battles are evidence that some New Englanders, New Englanders at least, um, were not um, antipathetic or allergic to slavery, uh, but in fact were quite happy to keep people enslaved, even um, going to the extent of breaking the law or breaking agreements. Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering if you could address a pattern that the kind of chronology you outline um, of the rise of 
um, lawsuits starting in the 60s and, and the 70s. I was wondering, what I thought I noticed <laughs> when I was looking at some of this material was that around the turn of the century, as in Virginia around the turn of the century, there's an attempt to codify the law of slavery. And maybe um, um, James has thought on this too. It seems to me around the like, around 1700, there's an attempt to codify the law of slavery in many of the different colonies, including Massachusetts. And that's the point when Sewell and, and, and others, um, including Manuel Jala, who is right, right, a very um, a, a learned um, petition um, um, to the state legislature, or colonial legislature, whatever, they attack slavery per se. I mean, you made this distinction. And I see, in New England at least, attacks on slavery itself in petitions um, tends to decline after about 1710 or so. It seems like that battle is, is, in, is, is engaged and then lost. And it's not until the 1770s that slavery per se comes under attack again. Yeah. And I wonder if, if you've noticed that or have thoughts about that. I think that's the general chronology, that that's when, the, 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 that right around 1800, is, and I actually really liked reading um, James's uh, piece because it gave me a little bit more context for what was going on in 1800, in addition to the fact that I think there are demographic numbers where slave, the number of slaves are increasing and um, slave trade opens up for England during this period. Um, so, oh, are we talking 1700 or 18? Yes, 1700. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, and, and so I think there is like, this is, a, I, I'm not an expert during the, of the early 18th century, but it does seem like there's an opening. Um, but, and I think that there, I think that as England is also becoming a much more commercialized society and a less a Puritan society, there's a stronger acceptance of slavery. And I argue that in my dissertation that this period, sort of borrowing from um, Ira Berlin's sort of generational, um, sort of construction, that this is the closest thing that there is to a plantation era in Massachusetts. And this is a period in which generally people are accepting slavery, using slavery, and aren't questioning it as much. And so there's a lot of statutes that come through. And I think, I think Jim adds to even more context to why those statutes start to come through. Does that okay. answer? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, this doesn't totally answer your question either, but one of, the, one of the things that's happening after 1720 is they stop passing laws altogether dealing with slaves. I'm sorry. Well, this doesn't answer your question entirely, but one of the things, if you were to sort of chart the number of slaves in a place like Massachusetts, number of laws being passed regarding people of color, after about 1710, the number drops dramatically. And they almost stop legislating the issue altogether. And then around 1760, at least in, in the assembly, they start legislating it again. Now, that doesn't under explain why these suits aren't coming before courts, but it does sort of explain, at least in part, people's receptivity toward the suits. It's almost as if they're done with this for now. I resist saying they're getting better at law because it sounds teleological, but there is this sort of sense that we're moving on to other issues right now, and then they return to this question later. So it fits a broader pattern occurring with statutes as well. Just, just as a comparative, Virginia, the Virginia legislature passes something on slavery virtually every session all the time. I, I mean, they're obsessed with it, and, and, and that's, uh, so, so there, there's an, an interesting contrast for somebody to write a different paper about. I mean, that's really when North and South start to diverge, at least under the law in that moment. Um, I think we've got time for, I think I've been told to bring this session to a close, bang on the dot, right? So, but I think we've got time for one more question then. Um, yeah. You can yell. Yeah. yeah.
very quickly, South and North Carolina and Virginia all respond to the Stono Rebellion, uh, which is 1739, with a whole series of laws regu regulating slavery in a variety of ways, both making it harsher and less harsh. Uh, to, to ameliorate and at the same time to clamp down. Uh, South Carolina actually suspends the importation of slaves for a while because they're so paranoid. Um, I don't know about New York. I, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think that all this politics and law and, and self-government nonsense is only the first step. I think that you know, African Americans figure into this equation as well in many ways. 1702 in New York, 1708 in New York, 1712 in New York, and I think 1720 in New York produced statute laws that are at least in part a response to African Americans rising up or rebelling or murdering their masters. It's written into the laws themselves. Um, they often create harsher regimes, so have a negative effect. Uh, but they also occur in subtle ways, too. Slaves are petitioning to marry each other. They're petitioning for freedom. And this combination, this sort of moving, complicated edifice of personal and political motivations all together produce these very provincially specific regimes. At least that's how I would look at it. So there's definitely a, a second paper to be written. Well, um, it, it, uh, I think we've had a terrific uh, panel. Um, we've understood the centrality of the law. And uh, it just remains, I think, to uh, thank our panelists. Uh, you can clap one more time.